Our next panel is going to be about the challenges of working in football. Um, Ted needs no introduction. He's a big part of the reason we're all here. Um, our three guests are, are Jackie Oatley, uh, sports broadcaster for ITV and Sky. Uh, she was the first female commentator on Match of the Day. Um, Emma Hayes, one of the most successful coaches and um, of uh, current football coach of, of Chelsea Women's in the Women's Super League. And uh, Vossi de Boot, I, I may have butchered that, so apologies. Um, head of Sports Science at Ajax, obviously. Uh, she spoke earlier today about all the cool things happening at the Ajax Academy and youth development and uh, the innovative things they're using in their academy. Uh, so I'll let Ted uh, kick it off. All right, so we did the, the short intros, but that, that's mostly because I wanted to, to get tucked into this. I want origin stories here. Like, were you bitten by a radioactive football spider? Uh, and we're going to start with Emma here. Um, how did you get stuck into this? And uh, you know, are you like formally trained as a as a Chelsea women's football coach? Is there a program for that? I don't know what being formally trained as a football <laughs> manager actually is. They can send you on a lo load of shite football courses around the world, and UEFA, and everybody can stick a badge beside it and say. Mm. You are a pro-licensed coach. To be quite honest with you, I learned absolutely zero in most of those environments. And most of the learning comes from probably life itself. I'm from a working class family and a self-employed father who always bought money home every day. And I, I only ever understood the value of hard work and working for yourself and being reliant on those things, and I think that's been so instilled in the way that I am as a coach. I had no ambition to be a football coach. I wanted to be a spy for MI5 or MI6, and I'm trained, apparently. You, not. <laughs> you, you actually do travel on a regular basis around Europe? Yeah. OK, we don't want to talk about that, though, because that's, like, that's a little tricky. Um, so yeah, and, and one of the things I actually thought in like my own research about coaching mm. is that Almost nobody who is, is degree taught or a book learner understands how you learn. You learn completely differently than almost everybody else. It's much more like a plumber or an apprenticeship in that like, you know, someone teaches you things, you then take things, you have reps, you adapt to that. I found that like, almost impossible to understand at first without that framework. And, and I know for a fact there are a lot of owners that are just like, well, just tell them to do it that way. And, like, they don't necessarily know that because they don't have that experience or that background. Well, also, there's, one, there's no one uh, methodology, and, and often the case in coaching, uh, there's so much subjective application of what goes on. Different coaches coach different things based on what they're either exposed to or they enjoy, et cetera, et cetera. And coaching courses, more, more often than not, set you up to be able to coach a lot of non-contextual situations that really bore the life out of players most of the time. <laughs> it's well, true. That's just my, my feeling of it. So I think the more and more that you're in a world where there's so much subjective application, the more I do this, the more and more objective I try and create the references in that application because then you, you just avoid so much... Um, just challenge with players. And, I, and then I think about, you know, how you get to that point. Granted, my coaching journey might have been like that. The best experiences was when I failed the most, usually when I was sacked, usually when I fucked up, <laughs> usually when I didn't do particularly well. But the reflection part, I think, drove me to the next stages. And I think again and again, constantly looking for another edge to keep doing that. And that never ends and you've got to be so open even as I'm aging more and more to not being shut off to doing it the same way I did it before just because it was successful then. That's the biggest trap you can fall into in this profession. You've got to, in fact it's a slogan in our club, what got us here won't get us there and I think you have to live by that but that's exhausting because you're constantly having to learn all of the time in a profession where the road map is all over the place. Being uncomfortable in football is both a constant, but also very difficult, especially at the coach level. All right, Jackie, how did you end up here? And uh, you know, I mean, you, you are one of the most notable uh, women's journalists in, in football, period. Uh, tell us a little bit about your story. 
Okay, how long have you got? <laughs> Let me try and give you the really short version, which is very difficult, but I'll try and give you the short version, which is I, I got into football as a kid. I was obsessed with, well, I loved sport, and then saw a football match on TV one day, and something clicked in my head, and I was like, oh my God, I need to see this. I need to breathe it. I need to live it. And uh, I moved from an all-girls school to an all-boys school, so I could go to virtually all boys, not entirely course. Um, so I could have somebody to go and watch Wolverhampton Wanderers with with me every week. Um, and sometimes they came and sometimes they didn't. I'd just go anyway on a coach to Grimsby away on a Tuesday night because I was a little bit strange. And then um, nobody ever suggested working in sports broadcasting or journalism despite my football utter obsession and the fact that I was okay at languages and words and what have you at school. <coughs> I never put two and two together, neither did they. You have to fast forward a lot of years to when I was 27 to one day when I just thought, ah, oh, I can't stand my job, which was a proper job, working in intellectual property, protecting brands on the internet. I had a really fun flat share in London with my friends, and I was working in, in a job that paid pretty well in Fulham. And, um, and I'd injured my knee badly, playing football badly, uh, in Chiswick, and, well, in Egham, but playing for Chiswick. And I thought, if I can't play football anymore, I need to do something else to be immersed in it, apart from watching Wolverhampton Wanderers home and away every Saturday with the London Wolves, with, with uh, all the guys with the carry bags of tinnies we go around the country. It was fun, but I felt like I needed to be in football, and I felt that just not being able to watch every single match of a World Cup was like an infringement of my basic human rights. I couldn't believe that people in grown-up jobs couldn't watch Panama versus <laughs> Colombia or something. It was just weird, and I thought, no, I need to do something so... I said I'd try and give you the short version. So I decided to give up my job, give up my flat, uh, after six months of evening courses and uh, hospital radio, and I was like, right, yep, it's definitely what I want to do. Um, and I thought I'd have to chuck myself into it. So I had nowhere to live, no job, slept on friends' floors for a few nights here, a few nights there. It's before the days of anyone having um, spare rooms, and they were very kind on that front, and I did full-time work experience, age 27. Mm. And I thought, well, I need to do this properly. I don't want to do it badly, and neither can I just get a job without proper qualifications. So I spent all my savings that I saved up to buy a flat on moving up to Sheffield to do a one-year postgraduate diploma in broadcast journalism. And as soon as I got there, I wrote to all the local BBC stations and said, I'm a mature student, I'm in a hurry, I really want to work somehow while I'm doing this course. And BBC Leeds invited me in for a couple of days in the TV news. I wasn't interested in TV, just wanted to do radio sport. And um, they offered me 10 minutes slot on a Saturday doing the non-league football roundup, which I loved. Like 21 pounds a week, barely covered my petrol up there. But I did not care about money, did not care. I'd finally found something that I really, really wanted to do, and I gave everything to it. I unfortunately had to split up with my boyfriend who was down south. I worked any shift here, there, and everywhere. And by the end of my course, just freelanced all over the country until BBC um, rang me up and invited me down. And then I was doing an overnight at... Five Live, I was doing a day a week at BBC London, I was doing some news at BBC WM, I was doing some sport up in Leeds, and just worked the entire time, and I found the harder I worked, the more doors opened for me, and again, I'm trying to fast forward the story, sorry, um, moved back down to London, uh, did more for Five Live, commentating on the Women's Euros, it was my first commentary gig in 2005 in the northwest of England, and then did Premier League for another couple of years, a match of the day asked me to do a game, which judging by the... <laughs> incredible reaction in the Daily Mail. You'd have thought they'd have given me a job having just come off a building site or something or off a, I don't know, off some other industry as if I'd never kicked a ball in my life. They assumed I hadn't, of course. And, uh, and it was all very odd, but I just kept my head down, just kept working, 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 and, um, yeah, opportunities have come up, and it's a crazy life, but I love it. Deeply compelled, it sounds like. Uh, so, Vasa... Your background, I believe, is a little bit different, especially when you come to like, your university background. Can you fill us in a little bit? Yeah, so I always wanted to do physiotherapy for animals because I was an animal lover and I mm. thought that was going to be great. So then I studied physiotherapy and at the end of the course, because you first have to do physiotherapy on, on, on human beings, um, I actually discovered that a lot of what, what physiotherapy for animals was at that stage wasn't proved and wasn't really doing much. So I was quite disappointed at that time that I spent four years of my life trying to get a certain dream job that in the end didn't turn out to be that dream. Um, and then I thought, well, I've always been really good at physics, so uh, I want to st study then human movement science, do a master's there. And I could do that 
um, final master's program in Michigan, uh, for Michigan State University, and I had an equine performance center. So cool, I could do um, biomechanics on horses, so I was back with the animals, um, and um, did something that I was good at. And then um, I really enjoyed the topic, and I really liked that last master thesis, but I just didn't like East Lansing, Michigan that much. That's actually a thing that um, we hear a lot in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> so when they asked me to stay and maybe do a PhD, um, I was still in doubt and I went back to the Netherlands and then an old classmate that I'd been in contact with uh, rang me up and said, well, um, Ajax bought this amazing movement lab, but it's all um, equipment coming from the US, which no one here apparently knows how to use it, not even people from the university. <laughs> and I saw in your last thesis that you actually use some of that equipment. Can you help me out? So I was th thought I was just going to go and help out a friend. And then all of a sudden, there was a whole panel uh, there with, with the sports doctor and like the ICT guy and all the people that were involved in the, in the new um, science uh, uh, lab. And they were doing a job interview. And I was just kind of sur sort of surprised I was even late for that. Um, and then I said, well, guys, I thought I was coming here to help you guys out because I've used this equipment, but you have to tell me everything about the sport because I know it from like a fan base level, but that's all. Like I don't have the in-depth knowledge of football like Dennis Bergkamp, who was there, uh, has. So uh, I wasn't pretending knowing anything about it. So then they said, well, we have that knowledge, so don't worry about that, but you have knowledge that we don't have. So would you mind trying at least for a while? And then. Um, did that for two weeks, built up the lab, <coughs> everything was still in boxes, so I had to like soldate stuff. Um, and then we did that for a week and then we did a test case and Adidas came in and we showed, showed them and they were really happy with the results. So they were like, yeah, cool, now the science lab set up. And they asked me to, um, and this was all non-paid by the way, because I was just helping, right? Um, and then they said, well, we can put you on a zero-hour contract for half a year if you want, and then we can continue doing these showcases. Um, so I did, um, and I never left. And from there, we built the sports science and analytic department, which, as I said this morning, now is 12 people wow. uh, and does a lot other stuff than that we started with. But that's basically how I got into it. Do you mind if I follow up on that? Because I've heard from other How many women are part of that 12? Um, so it's myself, then the one for the second team and the under 19s, and then our database architect, so it's four. Okay, so I've, I've met at least two of those, I believe. And, and that's actually quite unusual. Uh, like, the, there are not that many women in and around mm -hmm. analytics. And, and even, so one of the questions that I wanted to get to at some point, and we'll just lead into that because I think it's a big deal. Like, if we look out here in the audience, there are not very many women right here. And we are trying as StatsBomb to, to support women's football more and more. And Emma's team, um, you know, we're giving them our tools and data. And, and one of the things I said earlier is that it's kind of fun for us when we think that the women's team actually has better data than the men's teams. But that's like a unique wrinkle for, for the moment. We're trying to do stuff, but we, we haven't had that much success. And, and kind of as a, as a company, but as an industry, how do we get more women involved? Because right, I think this is just like the, the huge compelling question for it. Women's football is on a rise, but it's just getting started on that journey. So if you have thoughts, like fill us in. Well, I think you have to start with confirmation bias. Because if you want to start looking for the white Renault that you plan to buy at the weekend, then that's all you will see. If you want to open up opportunities for somebody else, then you have to reshift your brain and its focus to perhaps interest that different uh, type of employee to, to your organisation. And, and I think that in itself is a challenge because football, as we know, is traditionally a um, male-dominated sport. And yes, granted, those perhaps within it are coming, um, you know, are mostly male. But as you're seeing from a human performance perspective, if you're prepared to go outside of the box a little bit, perhaps look at the skill sets. I, think, I think equine uh, physiotherapy is a lot out of the box, but yeah, nevertheless, yeah. That's, that's a very valid point. It's an edge, though. It's a, <laughs> it's a game changer, at least. Um, I'm sure they would say it was. I, I think the starting point has to be in, in our minds and being in a position to start to want to draw. I have this conversation all the time internally about 
why we can't get more female coaches or why we can't and it's and half the time it's because it's a lot easier not to do it sure because there's a, a greater accessibility uh, for example and so perhaps in the short term there'll be a degree of investment or upskilling and educating around the game of football but ultimately it's it's about whether we, we're prepared to do that so Jackie the the media in the sports realm is almost overwhelmingly white and male and and obviously like that that's that's not something that we're flagging up right now it's it's, it's a thing that's been in the media for the last couple of years as as we see massive changes in you know it's it's shifting around the, the bits but we're not seeing the the population shift that much you are one of the few representatives of of like women in, in major media in the UK, especially on the sporting side. And you've told us about this incredibly compelling thing where you had to do it for free and you had to go to all of these different places. Are there just not opportunities in that space? No, there are opportunities. That's the interesting thing. It's a complete myth if anyone thinks that there aren't opportunities for women to work in football. Because as Emma, who I've known for years, um, has been involved with our organization, Women in Football, which we set up in, in 2007, should after my first match of the day, actually, with a sort of crazy reaction to it. Um, we have done as much as we can to try to amend the culture because I think a lot of it is the culture and the perceived culture of people not necessarily wanting to work in an industry where they feel there aren't people like them and it's going to be really hard for them, maybe such as in coaching, seeing mm -hmm. somebody like Emma is clearly going to inspire a young female coach to think, oh, okay, I can see it, potentially I can be it. Hopefully that's the case now with the more visible roles such as broadcasting and media people are seeing. For example, I do football matches for BBC on a Saturday on Final Score. Quite often we have a minimum of four female reporters five, six, the culture at BBC broadcasting and sport is, is very open. I think newspapers, it is very different. There's certainly a cultural perception, and I think I could see why. Um, again, now I'm on the board of the Football Writers Association trying to address that. They really are trying to get more females on board. And, and I think you can't just talk about it. You can't just mm -hmm. say, oh, we need more women to come in. I think we have to have a responsibility. And mm -hmm. personally, I take that responsibility to be a mentor very much quietly behind the scenes. If I meet a woman in a press box, I'll chat to her, I'll find out what her background is, keep in touch, direct message her on Twitter, invite her to an event we're going to. Um, I'm um, organizing an event for the late Vicky Orweiss, who was the first female football staff writer on a tabloid newspaper who sadly passed away this year. There still aren't any staff female football writers on tabloid newspapers. I mean, not very much has changed, but she did it for 20 years. And so we're honoring her next month. And, and um, contacting lots of women in football, up and coming ones, people who didn't know Vic, but would have been inspired by her to come along to this event so we can put them on tables together, introduce them to other women in the industry and men in the industry, because it'll be full of male writers too. I think you have to make a practical difference. There's no offense to, to this panel, but there's no point in just talking. No. We have to actually do stuff. Mm. So individuals have to, Emma does a lot. I mean, you do coaching sessions, you mentor people, don't you? I, do, I do for the coaches, even in the league. Absolutely. But I make sure, after, you know, all the females that I've uh, built relationships with, if they're struggling, they're getting a set of bad results, I'll always call them and get them to walk and talk through it. Because I think in order to keep people in the job with less experience, perhaps, they need that degree of soundboard or networking, which I think women don't do particularly well. Yeah, exactly. And when we were coming through, perhaps we didn't have people that we could yeah. go to yeah. and pick up the phone and go, I'm struggling, I've got like these photographers and, and people wanting a bit of you and not having a clue. I didn't have a clue how to handle the scrutiny that came my way. No idea. So I, I make it my business now to make sure that I reach out to up and coming commentators just very quietly and um, broadcast, but newspaper journalists in particular, because the culture is very difficult, um, to encourage them. And if I see somebody who does something well, I'll always message them. And, and, mm. and also jobs, jobs, you know, new students coming through. And I'm going to talk to universities. And, and last night I was doing two talks at schools and I always say, contact me if I can help, if you need contacts with, with things. Or, or if you're coming out of university and you're wondering, are opportunities there? I'm telling you, opportunities are there. People do want to diversify their workforce. So it's a case of finding the best people, so those best female writers, the, the talent that is coming through and the ones who have the aptitude and the willingness 
to put in the hours and the shifts and to make it work. Once you see a gem like that, then it's a case of trying to get them and match make them, if you like. I was sure. match made with my husband. I wouldn't have any children if I hadn't been put together with him. <laughs> so I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to match make up and coming women with jobs and other mentors and people. And that way we can also bring them up together and, and hopefully make it a bit easier. For so them. football on the men's side is kind of wild like that. I, I've compared it in the past to being like, football, the only place that I know that is nearly as networked as football is the VC realm. So like the venture capitalists who know everybody and you know, hey, do you want in on this? Do you want to have part of this deal? And the men's side is very much that way too, which makes it actually really weird as a business to sell your product because you have to find the right people to talk to and then your introductions change. And so like I can totally see how, how the networking element of the, of the women's side is a, important, but B, also challenging because there, isn't, there aren't as many women to network. So like you just don't have as many nodes from a, a network perspective. Um, so Vasa, you run a department and, and you run it inside of IX and you've been there for eight years, is it? Yeah, nine season, eight years. Yeah, wow, very cool. Um, so like, talk to us a little bit about the challenges and responsibilities of, of that department. So to start with, yes, I was the 27 year old girl with a ponytail running around the field with some speed lights and all these men coaches were just like, who is she? <laughs> Because, yeah, I can see who's fast, the one who's with the ball fastest. Uh, so, yeah, I really had to prove myself, not only as being a woman, because I never felt like Ajax ever made a big deal out of that, but uh, more an analyst in football. What are you doing here? We never had analysts. Why all of a sudden, all of a sudden we're here? So I feel like I had to prove like the, the work that I do anyway, whether I was men or female. Um, but and, now, like, you're departmental running, and that, yeah, yeah. that responsibility has completely changed. Yeah. So, as I said, in Ajax, I never really felt like, like um, being a woman made any difference, because no one ever really reacted on it. Um, and I think at this stage, as a department, we never actively look for male or female employees, mm -hmm. but I think it does help that uh, they see me as the head of sports science, so really talented females actually contact me because they feel like maybe I can have a chance here because mm -hmm. they are open. So I think the fact that we have four um, is actually not because we've been acti actively searching for them, but just because they gave us the opportunity to see them because they were um, contacting us mm -hmm. thinking maybe if there's someone in that role at that club, they'll give me a chance. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I think that, that that makes a big difference over clubs that don't really have that figure there. Um, and as I said, I've never been really aware of being a, a woman in this world until last season where we won uh, the league. And then there was a picture of the whole team and the staff was part of the picture as well. And I was in the picture and there were two reactions. So one was, what's she doing in the team and blah, 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 all the bad, bad stuff you always get behind, like underneath every photo. But another one was a lot of women saying, how cool there is finally a woman in the staff of a man's team. Um, and apparently there's like girls having that photo above their bed saying, I can be part of the staff of Ajax. So I never really thought of that, but people just been telling me that being an example is important. And now mm -hmm. I'm a lot more aware of that, yeah, that that can help others as well. It is, you could like naturally get thrust into this role model space even if you've never thought of yourself as that, simply because you are representative, at least a little bit, mm -hmm. in a space that doesn't have many. Um, I think if we were hiring and existed in the US right now, we would have a little bit easier time because US women's soccer is so much more prevalent and there are so many more girls in the US that play that sport that you know naturally affiliated with it versus European, it feels like it's really kind of starting its journey. In some cases, like Germany, they've been very good for a very long time, but it's, it's very different in different cultures. Now, you have a lot of people that report directly to you. Like mm. you, you heard various cats and players and analysts and sports scientists and, and whatever. Like fill us in a little bit on, on like the daily challenges. I had to break it down. And um, I think until this season, I was probably overseeing 40 people. By yourself or like with, with you know, sort of one filtered other, reports? One other. So uh, a department had grown organically from, you know, an amateur part-time to a full-time operation. We now have 19 full-time staff, which in a women's setup is, you know, quite a lot. So now I just manage the head of medicine and the head of performance. And between them, they manage everything in and around that. Because so much of the job, I suspect, is that much similar to that in the men's game where... 
I'm either reporting up, reporting across. Sometimes out, so I mean, it be, might be commercial, it might be marketing. Yes, the CEO, I deal directly with Marina around recruitment um, and then the development of the long-term recruitment platforms for the section. Chelsea's very unusual in that way in that Marina is yeah. also like the, the person that runs a lot of the operation. Uh, to be honest, I mean, I, I can't, uh, Jackie and I were talking about this before, there's no token gesture here. That they really support the women's game and everything we've ever asked for. There's been a progressive build towards that, but Marina I deal with on the player transfer side. Um, and on the business side, I deal with our CEO, and then perhaps legal, because I'm also on the board um, of our foundation, and I'm now becoming a trustee for the Past Players Trust, so I'm involved in other activities. And you're a mother. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, you know, you've got a lot yeah. of free time, is what you're telling yeah, us. Yeah, that, that's the, the hardest job of all. <laughs> and every parent in this room knows that that is unbelievably challenging, especially when they don't sleep very well, when they're sick or things like that. But that is most importantly, the most rewarding and the most important. I this is just football. I think one of my favorite visual images of the last year is, I think your Twitter feed had a photo of your baby in a, in a push chair or a pram that, while you were out scouting. Uh, oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> I had, to, to, had to, to think about getting a pram that was good enough to carry the recruitment uh, books and packages, as well as get the milk in, et cetera. And the good news about having a baby in recruitment is you always get the best seats and everybody always helps you carry the baby up the stairs and, and all of that. And really, really helpful when you're recruiting a player because it's very easy to get them to talk to the baby and then, you know, you can bypass agents, et cetera. So that was Ooh, that's hugely a great successful Excellent. for us. This There's a reason this Emma has a gift of the gab. She really yeah, has pass marks. She but does. The game has changed. I think I'm probably fortunate. I've been in a job for almost eight years. So naturally, the evolution of my responsibilities within that have changed. Sometimes people think it gets easier when you hire more people. No, it get, it, it's a, you just have a different challenge. They may manage some things that you might have managed in the past, and now you're just managing a whole set of different things. But I enjoy it. I enjoy the work. It's relentless. And I can totally understand why managers take time out and stop in this business because to do it for seven, eight years non-stop, I'm extremely proud of myself because it's a hard, hard job to do. Yeah, and especially in balancing a family. And, yeah. and we know like many of the men that I've talked to, like they also find that difficult or in some cases impossible to, to stay connected to their family on a regular basis. Like I know a couple of football coaches that I used to work with that their, their wife and their family settled in the place that they were at for a while and then their job then takes them elsewhere. And, yeah. and in some cases, it's China. Uh, for others, you know, it's London, but their family's based in Manchester. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, they don't have to deal with that in a way. Like, they have some level of freedom, or they just miss out on it. Yeah. And, and mothers don't really have the opportunity to miss out on that. No, but one thing I do think that I'm fortunate to do, which I don't maybe see as much in our men's building as I will in ours, is if I want to bring my son to work, I will. And I'm not going to apologize for it either. There's either another responsibility to be a parent. One, children being around the work environment is actually a really nice thing at the right time. Look, don't get me wrong, we're in a, a business and we have to work, but I usually bring him in on a Saturday and it makes it a lot easier on a, a, a shorter day that um, I don't feel resentful about my job because I haven't seen much of him all week and that he can be in an environment where the players get to see me as a human and not just as their, their manager. And I think, and I've got a lot of staff too that are parents and it's something I always encourage. You know, I encourage that they die. I don't want to, I don't want the fathers, the mothers in my team to, in my staff to, to miss out on those opportunities or um, suppress that emotion when it gets difficult well, that, that's, that's another thing that, that Vossel was talking about, essentially, like, you know, they've got a representative, but also, like, you're making sure that they feel comfortable as, like, part of their career path, which is another big deal. Yeah. Uh, Jackie, football is hugely stressful, and, and especially for the team, people in the team space. Uh, I want to ask each of you, actually, because I think that you might have different interesting answers. Mm -hmm. What brings you joy? Now, you're obviously very passionate about this, and, and you might perhaps say, Last year's Wolves teams bring you bring you joy. This year, yeah, it's still bringing me joy. Four wins in a row. Thank you very much. <laughs> Come on, me babbies. But what aside from that, more more specifically about your job, though. All oh, right, yeah, sorry. Um, 
oh gosh, joy. Well, it's so varied, it's so different, it's so random. <laughs> I have such a random life because I'm, apart from being on contract with ITV to do the darts, I'm otherwise freelance. So therefore, I do lots of different things. So tomorrow morning, I'm getting up at four o'clock to do the sport on Radio 4. And then I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be on air all evening on Sky Sports News till midnight on the same day, which is not my normal Saturday. Normally, I do a match on a Saturday, maybe with Radio 4. Um, but in terms of joy, I, I was saying to Emma earlier, my favorite part of the job is, is getting interesting stuff out of people. I love asking questions. It's my favorite thing. So any opportunity I get, so whether it's presenting or reporting or, or whatever side of it it is, I like if I'm doing a Radio 4 interview in the morning, whoever I'll be talking to, doing rugby and football in the morning, I want them to say something interesting, so it's my job to get them to. So on a Saturday, sometimes I'll do the match of the day interview afterwards, depending on what the commentator's doing. And if they ask me to do it, then it's my opportunity to ask them something very fair, but direct, maybe with a follow-up question, to get them to say something that's interesting, insight. I'm not trying to catch them out. But I do want the person that I'm asking a question to to tell us something that people at home didn't already know. And that's why Emma's pretty easy to interview, because she'll always give you something. She'll never just give you bland platitudes. And, and someone like my manager, Nuno, the Wolves manager, isn't my own, but I'd love him to be, <laughs> if you wanted to be. He, um, is the, he doesn't want to tell you anything, ever. Tough game, tough opponents, tough, oh, oh tough, yeah, tough, everything's tough. I'm like... Why, why, why? So Often it's a second question. language thing. And actually, yeah. one of the amazing things about today was how detailed and impressive uh, all three of our, our, our main presenters here were in their second language. Like, these were fantastic mm. presentations. Uh, I couldn't <laughs> obviously do that. Uh, basically, my, my second language is Jesse Marsh's team talk mm -hmm. that he gave. Like, that's as good as my German is probably going to get. But yeah, I mean, I, look, it, it is. Uh, for Nuno especially, but sometimes they use that as protection too, right? And so it's. Yeah, sure. And I understand it. But then. I knew he was trying to avoid saying something, so I asked him in a different way, and he gave a good answer. And so, in terms of joy, I think it's, because the job is so varied, which is enjoyable, um, I think it's nice to come home and feel you've done a good job at something. So it could be doing the darts, which I love doing, and you know, sometimes we get a ridiculous atmosphere. 5,000 people packed into Butlins in Minehead, for example, in this giant tent. <laughs> we're not allowed to call it a tent. Hope the PDC are watching. Banned. It's not a tent. It's, we're not even allowed to call it Big Top. It's a Big Top. We're not allowed to call it that. Um, but sometimes you can have the best buzz, and you can have fun as well. And I think apart from the serious stuff of sports news, you can have um, a load of fun, particularly with darts, when everyone's having a really good time and um I there's think alcohol work, involved sometimes isn't there occasionally okay. sometimes even the the um the people in the auditorium are drinking as well as the, the <laughs> you know the, the broadcasting crew but um but uh yeah i think also teamwork and that's why sometimes i found commentary a little bit solitary radio commentary because you'd be doing prep on your own all day, every day. In my case, I was single. I was just like that at my desk all the time. Very sad. And then you travel on your own. You sit the box on your own. And I'm a people person. So when the opportunity came, around the time I had my first baby, actually, sort of by coincidence, to do a bit of TV work, I started doing that. And then you're working with other people. And for me, mm. that's, that's where you've got somebody doing their job there. And your communication with them. Like, Emma's a good communicator. So she'll talk to her different staff members and players, of course, to get the best out of them, to make the greater output better. And that's what I enjoy doing. So whilst I'm the, the, the presenter of, of that particular program, there's so much other work that goes into it, but sometimes you have to communicate with them so that you're doing the best job for them and vice versa. Okay, and Vasa, like, what, what do you really love? Um, what I really love in my job is always searching for a different approach angle. Um, I really like those moments when I just talk to the coach and we said I only got like three minutes but we end up talking for an hour because we just get into an argument and in the end we, um, we split with, usually with a project, project that we're going to start mm -hmm. and that's when my head just goes Zzzz, okay we're going to do this and it gives me so much energy and then I, I, I can feel my team sometimes going like oh god there we go again it's going to be months of studying. Uh, the, the stats bomb people stuff. also have that happen regularly. I'm not sure that they're always that happy about it, but it brings me joy. And so exactly, you and I actually share a lot of that in like science and learning new things, because there's so much that's unknown about football. I get football. so excited, but just by the fact that it's, it's not, I mean, I could do sports science in speed skating and I would have been analyzing the same movements like through mm. so many rounds like I'm Dutch so we like speed skating over 10 kilometers mm -hmm. but yeah I mean football is just cool to study because there's so many things and there's so just because 
it's sometimes so hard, it's, it makes it so, so fun. So many different jobs. The, the research that you presented today, like that was new information to a lot of people. And like, holy shit, that was so cool. Like but the, imagine the buzz doing was... that, you go like, I'm actually discovering stuff. Yes. That, I mean, that, that gives me a lot of joy. Um, and also the, the young and, and, and um, enthusiastic team that I work with, I think is amazing and makes your, your life a lot easier if you have a team that works mm -hmm. with you that well. Um, now, Emma, you seem like you might be a little competitive. I, I, I get a slight vibe about that. Yeah. Sometimes competition, especially in the, the mm -hmm. cauldron that is football, can, can taint a lot of the things that you yeah. came in loving, especially when you're really busy and, and not always getting that much sleep. But like, there has to be, like, you've been doing this and you talk about the challenges and how difficult it's been. There have to be things that, that bring you forward. Um, I'm process driven, so I, I, re I genuinely don't get too high with the wins and too lows with the losses now. 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 I also... So it's almost a coping mechanism <laughs> yeah, to get Yeah, I don't. I objective. switch off. I go home, see my son. I don't really worry about it. I don't, I don't even stress to... I, I actually don't watch the opponent as much as I used to. <laughs> and that's because I focus more on my team. So I think I'm probably at the journey right now. I often describe my position as driving the bus with my headphones on. <laughs> and every now and then I'll go, yeah, what, what, no, nah, I put them on. It's whinging or it's complaining or it's... So I think in part, but you have to do that because you can't please everybody. And I know it's easier said than done, but we're humans and we get affected. So I probably enjoy winning, no doubt, number one. Scoring goals, actually, but scoring goals that come from deliberate practice. Yeah. That's the, the number one. We, we, we put in the work and yeah. then the results came and like that's, it's a bit like discovering things, right? And, and yeah. you're discovering more through, through sort of session process yeah. as opposed to measurement and analysis and evaluation. But sometimes maybe you've got that too. I think you changed a little bit of your process in, in the last year or two, right? I'll always do that anyway, but I like to be able to pull together an awful lot in the quickest amount of time. I hate isolated training, <laughs> hate things that are non-contextual, I hate things that are that make absolutely no sense. So if you're doing, I don't know, restarts and attacking play, your sessions have to be so that you get all of that applied without separating two things. You've got to be able to do it at the highest. And that takes a long time, I think, in coaching to be able to put that together. But I think communication, I enjoy good communication from players when they learn to speak uh, about the right things. And when that happens and you get good balance, you, you have a chance. And I'm a big fan on mirrors and self-reflection. Um, I reward for doing things well, but once there's the knock on the door, like, can we have a day off in three days? I'm like, <laughs> you got a game Sunday. I wouldn't even talk to me about those things. Everything in your focus should be that. And then that's up to me to recognise the situations to, to reward when the performance is there. But you've got to have consistency in behaviours. That's that is the most important thing. So much this all the time. The best players are the best players because they do that. They don't do that. They do that all of the time. And often people say to me, she could play a but and I wish she could do that. Yeah, I know, but more often than not, you have to work out in a really short amount of time. If we've given them absolutely everything, they're either going to cut it or they're not, and don't get sentimental about it. Off you go. It's true. And, and football itself is merciless. And, and from a, uh, a data and science perspective, like we, we often talk about like, the one thing that sport does not give you is time. And the one thing that scientists and st statisticians want is a lot of data and a lot of time. And it's this really uncomfortable tension between the two. So Jackie, you work in both men's and women's football. And you mentioned a little bit about some of the challenges that you face, especially on the women's side. We are a data group. We're here to talk about data and analytics. Like, fill us in a little bit about some of the difficulties there. Uh. <laughs> oh, you ask any journalist on the women's game, and journalists of the women's game all really want the women's game to do well, but they've chosen to do it. And just the, the problems over the years of trying to find out the most basic information has been such a pain in the neck. I, mean, I work in men's football every week, and I subscribe to a website called soccerassociation.com, and I think it's about... £33 a quarter or something, whatever, it, it works for me. I put a name of a player in, Bosch, all the stats, the, all the games are played, goals, whatever. And I love that. So for me, the more data, the better. It's simple. I can go straight to it. And for the free sites, it's more difficult to find. The women's game, 
There's nothing like that. Soccerway now has at least got mm. fixtures, results, formations. Wow, that's heavenly. Um, but still, we could do with a lot more. And I get on well with the people at the FA for years and years and years and years. I've been a friendly pain in the neck for them going, <laughs> when are you going to sort your website out? When are you going to sort your website out? Because trying to find out the basic things of who scored how many goals and things. I mean, it's not asking a lot, right? But for a long time, it's very difficult. And it's not that long ago, really, that when I was covering football, women's football for the BBC, when it was Women's FA Cup semi-final day, there was no information literally anywhere, <coughs> even on the internet, even on the FA website, no updates. I would physically have to phone up the press officer for the women's game and ask him to phone their representative at the game to find out what the scores were and the results were. No word of a lie. Alex Stone, I used to have to phone him and ask him who won the FA Cup semi-finals today. And bear in mind, I was the only journalist at the BBC who covered the women's game. It wasn't anywhere. Nobody knew. Nobody, dare was, I was say... Was it the year we won it? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is, it was quite... A, I guess it was quite a long time ago now. Maybe, was it 10 years ago? But really, in terms of the modern day, modern technology, um, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't good enough. And, and even then, WSL has really helped. You know, the, the website is better. But it was still had limited functionality. Mm -hmm. So whenever I talk to the FA about it, they say, we know, we know it has limited functionality. We can't go anywhere else with this product. We have to put it on another platform. And so they have improved. And now they've got a new FA player app. So you can see different games. You can choose a game and watch it. But I went on it the other day. All I wanted, because I was doing updates live on Sky Sports News, and I wanted to be able to go, you know, Arsenal are doing this, Chelsea are doing this, and blah, blah, blah. And you have to go to different web pages to find out who scored what goal. I just want the latest scores on one page. And again, it's some of the simple things. So really, in the women's game, there's a huge amount of scope if you would like to create an app or something that would be very welcome whereby you can just get all this information at your fingertips and it's user friendly and people put themselves in the position of the user of the user of the consumer of journalists and of fans who just want to know who scored it's not asking a lot is it yeah. oh my god it's not so it's i mean ease of access in the men's game to information is something we take completely for granted yeah I, you know like second to second in general because of the gambling companies really want to know like this is who scored when and they're grading it and and so there's this huge market out there that, that kind of drives that and the women's game a doesn't have the gambling i remember when we uh, i used to work in in sports betting for about a decade and uh, we had the men's world cup and it was awesome we're like oh my god this is so cool and then we had the women's world cup and it was just like i don't know one percent of the men's world cup and it was like you know interest but also just like that was where the game is at there's a lot it is starting to change and and as you say you know it's changed significantly in time but it is really still very nascent. I tell you what, though, anybody with a bit of knowledge about the women's game can absolutely clean up at the bookies because the odds are all over the shop. Oh, sure, they're terrible. Because they don't have a clue what's going on. So, I mean, I'm not Definitely. massively into betting myself, but there is mm -hmm. so much scope for people actually mm -hmm. making some money <laughs> if they know what they're doing. Really. Should, should that be your inclination and it is legal in the country that you live in? And uh, yeah, anyway, moving yeah, you on. You can put a bet on anything you like, can't you? And if you, if you know. You know something about it. Good luck to you. So, so the team that wears orange is pretty good, and and the team that I kind of have rooted for for most of my adult life um, is red. And we also have a good orange player or two. Uh, tell us a little bit about the women's football from the Netherlands. I think that Netherlands has a benefit that they've always been very uh, sort of gender neutral in their sports approach. So uh, yeah, I can go into history about how we had like, um, yeah, too long of a story, but um, sports clubs always had like a women's department, but most popular for the girls was field hockey. So we do really well in field hockey um, and soccer just wasn't much of a girls sport for a long time. But I think that, um, yeah, there were always girls in the men's teams, which also improved their skill for a long time. No one thought weird of that. I mean, there was just not enough girls to make a team, so they were with the guys, but they were girls, and that was fine. And I think that now, because the, the um, uh, women's team does so well, I see like a massive sort of like group of girls just overloading the, the girls' camps and clinics that we do, and we, we had a men's camps and clinics, then it was the question, can, can girls sign in? Yeah, sure, there was like 20 out of the 100 the first year, and it was like 90 out of 100 
the second year because they were just quicker with signing in. And then we thought, oh, maybe so we have to do like a separate one just for the girls and then another one for the men. So I think that, again, that example there just opens people's eyes and think, yeah, I, I was going to go into hockey because that's just what the girls do. But yeah, I like football better. We played it uh, on the little pitch behind my, uh, uh, my school. So I'll start doing that. It's, it's an option all of, all of a sudden. And, and the Netherlands have possibly the world's best center forward, uh, not to, you know, not to, <laughs> but in uh, Arsenal uh, and Vivian Miedema. But yeah. my favorite is actually Daniela van de Donk because yeah. she's a bit of a shithouser. And, and she's our shithouser for once. So unlike all of the male Chelsea players who basically were that way for about a decade, or Deli Alley or whatever, uh, it, it feels good to like you know root for somebody that's a little rough and tumble, uh, and the women's game in particular. Um, so Emma, we're, we've got one more question up here, and then we'll, we'll throw one or two out to the audience. But tell us a little bit about is Chelsea women's incorporating data, and, and how might that be changing how you're you know, attack. We saw Adrian up here do like massive amounts of talking about how it changed their planning and how they really incorporate that. I know that you guys are sort of just started on this, but can you fill us in a little bit on that? Yeah, I think the fact that we're just at the beginning stages of that mean we're going to go through a degree of trial and error. But what I found really interesting as a result of looking at this approach is you can go from, say, data from BBCs of, of our game, for example, then look at Opta and then look at StatsBomb. And you've got three unbelievable, completely different stories. And so the starting point for us was, OK, well, let's, let, let's at least start with one data set rather than listen to or, or, or reflect on things that are conflicting all over the place. Because at least let, let's try and create some consistent parameters. Um, I think I've spent the best part of the off-season recognising that as a team that's most dominant in possession of the ball, that we are most likely to be most dominant in the restarts in the opposition's half. So taking something as a data set like that, plus monitoring that in training, which you can't do through data, but creating similar data parameters so that we're monitoring the execution of those actions in training, and then seeing, like I said, um, deliberate practice, so when you get to the game at the weekend, winning, as I said, was an important thing. It's not as important as executing a goal which was so deliberately created that wasn't from open play. And that's, I think, where I've enjoyed uh, some of the, the games this year. And I think that's our starting point. The second will be in and around things that you can... We had another interesting conversation around, it, not about Van der Donk, about Katie McCabe. Interestingly, a stat went out for, for Arsenal's left back that said she's won the most tackles in, uh, she'd won the most tackles, no context. The reality is where she'd won the most tackles for a team. She was also the most taken on player, 1v1. Yeah, so you can, you, yeah, there's, and it's working through contradictions to say, well, she wins an awful lot, but she's beaten the most as well. So to be able to, to try to, to, to be able to come through the context as much as possible and then apply it where it really, really matters because players want it in a snapshot. They want just that bit that's going to help them win, and, but you have to decide that data set, I think, as coaches, rather than it be all over the place. Oh, absolutely. And, and for us, restarts have been a big feature of what we're doing this season. And I said, I said to you when I came here, we scored three goals against Bristol, all from throw-ins that nobody would have noticed, but but we did based on the fact that we're, what we'd been working at, and uh, and then going even further philosophically behind that to not script everything in its entirety, but be able to create. Um, a framework in training so that players can make decisions um, and execute again and again and again without it becoming repetitive. 
So one of the, the things that we often use data on, and I think that it's going to be a bigger thing, is, is uh, player development as well. And we don't have the lineage and, and what we call the longitudinal studies in the women's game. But being able to build that and saying, OK, this is where you're at right now, but this is where the best Chelsea left backs have been. Like that actually gives them something mm -hmm. aspirational. The players actually care about that because they've mm -hmm. got things that they know that they can work on. And then you know, on the men's side, they get individualized development plans to help out with that too. Um, you say the throw-ins and no one would have noticed. There is a team that has been around today that oh. actually hired a throw-in coach. I, I, I heard that the, they could be interested in things, but you know, we can't actually speak about that. I think I was mainly talking on the women's side. Oh, sure. I'm not talking on the men's side. And naturally, we take our leads from what's happening in the men's game. But I think, like I said, it's one thing to have analytics. It's one thing to have data. To apply that in a coaching perspective daily where the, that, the entire coaching team integrate that from top to bottom, that's utopia. Where it's not just things that are being done in separation. Like here, these are the data set for this and the training, they never merge, where you're actually putting that together on a regular basis where the players, yeah, listen, players roll their eyes at any opportunities where they're stood still for too long. But when you score goals off of things that um, perhaps you wouldn't have focused on, and that's where I think data-driven data decisions make the difference, at least for us right now. Well, I yeah. think it's really interesting to listen to like, the compelling, they want, they want the information. Go ahead. Can I ask a question? Do you think that data might even sort of help to develop the game and especially the women's game over time? For sure. Because just, just to drop like a, a big bomb here maybe on the stadium, if you look at the physical part of the, ah. uh, of the game and what we compared from our women's team to all our men's team, we saw that the physical capacity is about the same as the under 17s for the men, yeah. which as a out of the book data scientist, and shoot me if I'm wrong, um, makes complete sense if you would say, play it on a little bit of a smaller field. You're talking to the right person when you say yes. that. You do know I, that. I, Emma, Emma might have had some public uh, discussion and a column about this. Yeah, so I agree with you. This one. I, the goals smaller, argument I was wrong about. A smaller, but the, the pitch I'm not. Yeah, like a smaller field. Um, but also maybe a little bit of a lighter ball because. Sure. Just shooting and the impact that it makes. You, you know the interesting thing about the shooting of the ball component? The fact that we talked about the goals being too big. Oh, my God, my goalkeepers absolutely <laughs> ate me alive for weeks. <laughs> but do you know what was really good about priming for that? Goalkeeping went up another level at the World Cup. They were so agitated by that comment. They just, boom. And I thought, great, perfect. We don't have to sit and talk about shit goalkeepers anymore. <laughs> but the interesting thing about the women's game is that while there is enough research just about to say the goals are the right side, so there are more goals scored from outside the box in the women's game than there are the men's game. And you sit there and you say to yourself, well, hang on a minute. That in itself seems like a slight contradiction. You're saying the goal set... And it, I watched a free kick the other day for England uh, against Portugal. A player lined up, take the, and I thought, she's, she's never going to get anywhere near that. It's straight down the middle. You could argue, you know, it's hit the crossbar. But I, I, there's nothing she can do about that. Physically, she's just never, never going to get to those, regardless of how well you're coached and those no, to physical the, limitations. It comes down to the question, like, why is it 16 meter, 16 meter box? Why is it 16 meters? Why not 20? Why not 12? For a decent reason, that's within that 16 meters, that's the capacity of a good goalkeeper to react. So if you take the speed of the ball and the reaction time of a goalkeeper, he will be able to save it from outside the box. So you should think of... But you, do you know what will really sizing. help about what you said? Is the fact that I started this conversation with just a little bit of data. The women's <laughs> football community did not want to have it. They were like, you are taking the game back years. Yeah. For me, I, all I wanted to do was provoke the conversation. So I'm hoping with this type of work, we can be in a position, let, uh, let's have bigger conversation about the development of the game, just not just the pitch sizes. Fun. Like, in tennis, you play less Well, sets. let's make why? it entertaining. If entertaining. that pitch was a bit tighter, the game would be quicker. We've yeah, never why, had why a debate before slow? with stats and, and analysis involved. The debate has always been about people's opinions. Well, I Absolutely. think this, I think that. So you can take that onto the next level, if you don't mind, and provide us with a lot more information, because you're saying there are more goals than women. Well, I'd like to see those stats. I don't see any of these stats anywhere. As, as consumers, as journalists, 
it makes it far more interesting. And then if you do have the statistical analysis of what you're talking about, then maybe people, yes, we can have these conversations with coaches, with players, with managers. And then the people who can make the decisions potentially about changing things get to do it on statistics rather than just pure theory. We did a frankly groundbreaking study with an awful lot of historic data that looks at exactly that, but it is not our study to release. And that's as much as I can say about wow. that. So we've got to get and you drunk, right? We, and you no, <laughs> well, hmm. I, I, I've gotten in enough trouble with that one. So uh, let's wrap this up and, uh, and just thank our panelists very much for their time. Uh, very insightful.